Hello fellow truth seekers, this is Barbara Jean. I had a very, very powerful dream just a couple of hours ago. It's 1.30 in the morning. So I'm going to have to tear, try and keep my voice down. I hope you have some ability to turn your volume up. I'm going to try to keep my voice down because it's, only, like I said, 1.30 in the morning. November 20, 2020. I looked up the meaning of the number 20. It's the perfect waiting period, the completion of a perfect waiting of a waiting period. Let me see if I can find it. I can actually look it up for you. I looked it up for you. Let me see it. Number 20. So we got three 20s in this state, meaning a complete or perfect waiting period. For 20 years, Jacob waited for to get possession of his wife and property to be freed from the control of Laban, his father-in-law. That's Genesis 31, 38 through 40. Um, it's also half of 40, 2020. It is the, uh, it's about challenges or, or temporary difficulties that you may encounter. Your best to ride them out. So I guess we, that's the sign that we've actually done that. The meaning of 20 is empowerment. Number 20 says meaning a complete or perfect waiting period. Um, also God was, was, was to raise up Deborah at, and Barak who freed the people from bondage and that's Judges 4 through 20. So we're, it's, a, it's a freedom from bondage from oppressors, a sim symbol, uh, a symbol of your positive attitude and optimism. Uh, number 11, although I'm sorry, I'm reading the, oh no, I'm reading the right thing. Number 11 is a master number and it represents leadership, I believe. About leadership, optimism, positivity, intuitive master number. It resonates at an extremely high vibration. Uh, bringer of spiritual awareness and devout supporter of humankind. Um, represents the opposite, which is the which is the irresponsibility of breaking the law, which brings disorder and judgment. So it's the opposite. Um, oh, sorry. It says number 11 represents the, which is the irresponsibility of breaking the law, which brings order and disorder and judgment. So I guess it's about seeing disorder um, and how being able to to understand disorder, I think that's what it means. Ten number ten is about order, and then number eleven is about understanding disorder um, and judgment. So interesting. So um, yeah, I had a very 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 powerful dream this morning, or should I say last night? It was around. I think it was around nine twenty last night, and I. I, I slept on it, um, basically thought about it, contemplated it, and I kind of fell asleep again, and then I woke up just now, just knowing I have to make a video because it was so powerful. And, um, yeah, it was powerful. So I'm going to get to that in a second here. But first, before I do that, I had another dream, and I didn't understand it at first, but now it makes sense uh, looking back at a couple of uh, dreams that I ago, the Lord is expanding, it was expanding on some other dreams that I had, and now they make more sense to me. Um, <clears throat> of course, the dream, uh, it goes back to the dream where um, I was talking to you about the spirit of perfect love, this woman in pink. And um, first it started out with me being in the dumpster. Um, then something about Joe Biden rounding up the Christians. Uh, then me getting into his car, sleeping in his car, and being secreted to this secret place that he was going to going into a meeting. And then being chased by his henchman, his uh, yeah, his bodyguard, guards who were trying to gun me down, and they couldn't do it. And the woman with in pink, who was the spirit of perfect love was protecting me from his discovery, protecting me from his assassination, okay? 
But then the second part of the dream was when I was back in my childhood home um, in the project, um, which reminded me of the, the movie Divergent. And my mother was sitting in a chair as I went into my childhood home. My mother was sitting in a chair. She was sitting in a chair like she looked like the, we were in the movie Divergent. Um, and has you remember how uh, if you've seen the movie, uh, four sitting in the chair. He's under a uh, he's under simulation. Okay, he's under simulation and he's sitting there and it's kind of drug looking, drugged out looking face and um, his his eyes were glazed over and he temporarily he attacks Beatrice when he's because he's under mind control, so he attract attacks Beatrice in the movie because he's under mind mind control. And that's what that, that part of the dream reminded me of. It reminded me immediately of that moment in the movie where Four, who represents, you know, the Christ figure in the movie, um, is under control, a mind control, and he attacks Beatrice, his bride. And then, but in my dream, my mother's sitting there and she's got this kind of drug look, look looking face on, drugged out, and she's looking uh, like this. And then she says to me in this kind of drugged out state, she says, I know what's wrong with Beverly. I know, no, I know what happened to Beverly. And I said, what happened to Beverly? I was like, panic, or what? And because um, Beverly is my twin sister in real life, and she represents the church Pergamus in my dreams. Okay. And, uh, and then immediately after she said that, oh, and before that, well, like I said, when I, back in the, when I was being hunted down, hunted down by Joe Biden, um, I, this woman in pink led me, leads me to a pink room and I could feel the butterflies, the spirit of fear leaving my stomach. Okay. Leaving my stomach. Then I go to my childhood home and there's my mother sitting there and she's like, I know what happened to Beverly. who represents this church in my dreams. Okay. Then the spirit of fear, as she says, I said to her, what happened to Beverly? I could feel the butterflies leaving from my stomach again. There was a second departure of fear from my stomach. Okay. So twice in that dream, I had the spirit of fear leave when the spirit of perfect love was protecting me through the situation. Now I'm bringing this all up because it goes along with what I, the dream I just had yesterday. Not the dream I had, actually, it was yesterday morning, uh, early, early yesterday morning. And the dream I just had was just a few hours ago. So, um, but anyway, they all go together. So just stay with me. I know it's going to be a long video. It's going to be very complicated. I'm going to try and explain it the best I can. Um, but anyway, uh, just going to go, just going to have to pull, push forward through this. Okay. So in this dream, uh, of two, she says, well, I know what happened to Beverly. And I said, what happened to Beverly? And then again, I felt the butterflies, which means the spirit of fear. It was the spirit of fear that was controlling this church, the Church of Pergamos. Okay? Um, because that's the seed of Satan. The seed of Satan is in your stomach. That's what it says about the Church of Pergamos. Let me see if I find it here just to show you what I'm talking about. I know it's hard to, to explain all this, especially for people who have never heard this before. This may be the first time you hear it, but I don't know. So I'm just going on like the assumption that you've heard my other videos. I'm just hoping that you did because it's really hard to go back, keep going back and forth. But anyway, the Church of Pergamos is about the stomach. Um, I know thy works and where thy dwell. This is Revelations 2, starting in verse 12. Uh, I'm, even where Satan's seat is, okay? Thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days where an antipas, and you can add a T-O, antipasto, it's appetizer, antipas. It's the only it's the only part in the scriptures, in the book of Revelation. It talks about a person with by name, okay? Why? And I used to why does his name come up and nobody else? No, no, I'm sorry. That's David is also mentioned. David is mentioned as well. But why did they mention antipas? I mean, there was a lot of people who died, but for some reason he mentions antipas. And of course, we know when you put a T-O, that's a, it's in a Latin word for appetizer. It means a meal, something you eat. So it has to do with the stomach. Who was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, 
who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Okay, there it is, the reference to the stomach and to eating and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. There's the mouth there about eating, chewing, and then it comes up here. Then they, those who overcome, this is interesting. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. It's about eating. It's about the stomach. Isn't, it's not a coincidence. Isn't that amazing? It's about eating and it's about the stomach. Hidden manna. And will give him a white stone and the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receive it. So, the white stones, what's in your mouth? Your teeth. Your teeth are in your mouth and they're like white stones. Okay? To chew. To chew the doctrine. To chew. Well, the Bible talks about um, some people are on um, um, a milk because they can't stomach. They can't stomach the meatier things and the weightier things of the gospel. The weightier things of the truth. It's too much for them. Their stomachs are, are irritated because they don't have the ability to chew their food. Okay? And in the dream, my mother says to me, I know what happened to Beverly. And it also represents the swamp. The swampiest part, the swampy swamp, the swampy swamp is represented by the Church of Pergamos. And Beverly means a beaver field or a beaver dam or a swamp. Okay? Isn't that interesting? When you dam up something, the land around it becomes swampy because it gets flooded, right? So isn't that interesting? It's not a coincidence, people. The way the Lord has led my life is unbelievable. So, um, anyway, it's about he that overcometh, he will give a white stone. Now, my last dream I told you about, um, I was praying about, I was praying about, uh, uh, Canada. You know, in my dream, I was talking to the Lord about Canada. And Canada hands me four white stones through the television, but with this little mouse. The mouse represents like a rat. Those people who are ratting out are, maybe that's what that means, that the rat, the rat is, is ratting out the swamp. And it represents knowledge, that we're going to get knowledge of the swamp that's going on, and it's going to be coming through rats, through the, those people who are telling on each other. They're going to start speaking. They're going to start talking. And this church represents knowledge. And I told you this. The church represents knowledge, the stomach, because what it was that Eve was looking for in the garden? Eve was looking for knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay. She was tempted because she needed, she was, she was pushing the agenda like women do. She knew something had to change. Something had to move forward. The agenda had to move. Okay, I'm going to get to this in a second. So just stay with me. She was looking for knowledge. She could have gotten it from Adam, who obviously could have told her and pulled her aside and said, Eve, I can tell you what you need. Or we can go to the Lord and find out what it is that you're looking for. But he allowed her to go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She ate the fruit and it got stuck in the stomach. Okay, so this 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 church represents the quest for knowledge, okay, or the the lack of knowledge that destroys the church. And this church has a problem with their doctrine, which is knowledge. Okay, they have that's what destroys the church is their lack of knowledge. But when you find your knowledge, that is when you are able to chew the doctrine when you're able to digest your food and then you have this knowledge you're given knowledge and that's what the, 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 the accumulation of knowledge is what sets you free from the lack of knowledge of being destroyed by the lack of knowledge I hope you understand what I'm saying this church is about law this church is about courage this church is about knowledge this church is about faith in other words your works that you do for the Lord this church is about um, resting from your works. This church is about spiritual knowledge. This church is about crowning in your victory and, and your overcoming and, uh, and uh, anyway, anyway, overcoming the devil completely. It's your, it's your victory crown. Okay. 
So, every time I go and do a video, this little pop-up saying, we're doing a security check. Yeah, right. Uh, <clears throat> I have some fruity tea today. You see the color of it? How intense that color is. It's really, really fruity. It tastes good. It's really good. I got some lemon in there as well, as well as some honey. It's good for my throat. And you know, I've got a bad cough. It just never seems to go away. Hmm. Okay. Also in the dream that I had, there was a large stone like this that had a cutout in it. Okay? And I knew that's where the, the white stone was cut out of in the dream. This was a large stone. It was like a, uh, like the size of a large coconut. It's about this. And it was cut off. And I could see that it was the, the, the white stones were cut out from inside of the, this white, these white, large white, um, kind of tan colored stones that when you cut, they were white in the inside. Now, which is interesting because when I started thinking about it, it's just about this church. It says, um, I have a few things against it because you, though you have there them that hold the doctrine, the false teaching of Balaam. Okay. Who, what is the false teaching of Balaam? To cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. That's the stumbling block that this church has. Okay. So, like the, what this big light, large stone was like a stumbling block. It's a stumbling block, okay? And it's the uh, the this is what it, this is what this is the false doctrines that this church has a real problem with, wanting to take Israel's place to a replacement theology, basically. Um, it's eating things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. That is the great big stumbling blocks. But in what in the dream. The stones were the white stones for those of them overcome that overcome these false doctrines. They're given these new white stones with their names written on it. Isn't that interesting? So, um, what was what does this all mean? Okay, getting back to this this new dream that I had. And in this dream um, that I had uh, yesterday morning, uh, um, about twenty four hours ago, I guess. Um, I was on Mary Street with my twin sister, okay, and we were in bed together. You know, that's what that was kind of when I woke up in the dream. I went, "Oh, that's a little weird, Lord. What does that mean?" Then I had to think about it. But it was like when we were younger, when we were, we were ch children, you know, because we were twins. We always slept together. We always did. So I guess I thought, well, okay, well that makes sense because you know we shared the same crib. We shared, shared their same bed for years and years and years. And so until we got to be, you know, about, I guess, like, maybe younger than that, eight or nine, we stopped sleeping in the same beds. We've got, Lord, um, my mother got us bunk beds. Anyway, that's beside the point. In this um, dream, I was, we were sharing a bed in uh, Mary Street. And um, in this dream, my sister was learning how to use her mind. It was like um, she was all of a sudden discovering powers that she didn't have. As we were, she was learning how to open and do open and close doors with her mind. And I said to her, "You be a little careful with that because you know people you know might freak out some people who are not ready for this. You know what you're what you're learning." And she was saying, "Okay, I'll be careful. Basically, I'll be careful not to do this around too many people." And um, basically, that was the dream. Okay, so I thought about it. Okay, well, what does that mean? Why? Why was it was a really strong dream? It was a really, really strong impression. And I started thinking about it. And I was thinking, okay, in the in the dream with my mother, on my childhood at home, she says, "I know what happened to Beverly," and she was look at that kind of drugged out kind of look on her face, and it's because she was under mind control. And in this second dream I had just recently, yesterday morning was that she was learning to use her mind, her knowledge. There was a spiritual freedom that she suddenly seemed to be able to, she was suddenly capturing a power that she didn't have before because she was under mind control. But the spirit of fear, which resides in her stomach, 
right here. At least part of the fear, because I know there are fears that can reside in your your heart too, in your in your throat, in your throat, in your adrenal glands. Each one of these represents our, our, our um, glands in the body, and we can restore fear and all kinds of emotions in each one of them. But anyway, the spirit of fear here, um, in the stomach, and so I was just telling her to be careful how she uses her new knowledge, basically. Um, she didn't want to freak. I didn't. She didn't want to freak people out. Um, it was like because her mind was freed. Uh, that represented being in bed in the in the night. Represented uh, the subconscious mind being set free. That's what nighttime represents. Um, um, the temple is a dark blue. Represent. It's actually an indigo, it's a deep indigo colored blue, which represents your temple and represents the subconscious mind or the spiritual mind. And in this dream, it says that uh, in this in this church, he says he will give them a new white um, give them white stone and a new name which no man knoweth, save that he that receives it. So what has this got to do with Canada? Well, I just think that Canada is going to get some knowledge a long-awaited knowledge that's going to help set us free um, through the um, disclosure of those rats who are going to disclose a lot of information that's going to set us free from the captivity of our minds. That makes sense. The mind control that we've all been under. So that's a very hopeful hopeful word. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Then in that, this dream, this, the rat handed over four white stones. Four represents home security, the safety of four walls, the city four square. Four represents home security. So, um, and it was given to me by this, like I said, the rat, or the, in this case, it was uh, the mouse. But still, you could you could you could say the mouse and the rat are kind of equal when it comes to you know going into what what do rats and mouse mice do? They go into your kitchen or your pantry. And they get into your food. They get into your food supply. They they leave droppings all over the place. It's not, they're nasty creatures. They spread disease, just like in the plague. Um, the plagues of of Europe were uh, infest. They had rat infestations that caused bubonic plague. And so, this mouse, this rat, was handing over four white stones. The spirit of knowledge it's going to set us free so i think that's what that dream meant isn't that amazing that's amazing so it took me a little while to figure it out but i I'm, i think i'm getting it so um in this last dream i said um okay so the church of pergamos is now waking up they are no longer going to be ignorant of the things that they have been uh they've been uh destroyed by because of these people who have taught them false doctrines were casting stumbling blocks before them to um, to uh, for in its form of replacement theology uh, pagan worship um, and eating things sacrificed to idols and fornication okay they're waking up okay so it's a good sign it's a good thing um, all right I think that's all I need to say about that but I think that's really really cool so very optimistic Oh, a little tart. And the extra lemon juice I put in there. Ooh, wee. All right. Very interesting. Oh, before I leave that, I'm going to get to Adam and Eve. Let's go back to Adam and Eve and just go over their story just one more time because I, there's more I want to talk about with Adam and Eve. Um, the fall of man and woman. Um, God created man first, and then He created woman. And then there, there's a problem in the garden. This goes along with my last dream about the Church of Pergamos being set free. Yeah, all right. Um, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field that the Lord would, God had made, and He said unto the woman. Yea, hath God said, you shall not, eat, shall not eat of every tree of the garden? <clears throat> so this is that the tree of, we know what the name of the tree is, the tree of the knowledge, 
which we have the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the woman said, the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay? So there's something in E that is is pushing the agenda. There's something that she's dissatisfied about. Um, something in her life, even though she's sitting like, living in a paradise. As a woman, she's pushing the agenda. She's not a Jezebel here. Okay? She's a woman. Women push the agenda. There's something that's un undone. There's something that needs to be done here. What is it? And the test really, like I said before, was really a test for Adam. This whole scenario really was a test on Adam to see what he would do about the woman. Because the woman is going to push the agenda. She's going to need some things from Adam. Are you going to fulfill it? Are you going to help her? Are you going to let her fall? Which, of course, we see he lets her fall. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, okay, she's look, she's checking it out. She's looking to see it was good for food. That was the first thing she saw. It was good for food. Seed of Satan. Food. And it was pleasant to the eyes. And the tree to be desired to make one wise. So what's, what was she looking for? She was looking for to fill her stomach. Although there was lots of food out there. So there was more than just filling her stomach, obviously. Um, it was pretty. Women like pretty things. They like, like things that sparkle. And this must have sparkled, but there must have been other things out there that sparkled. But what was it she was really looking for? She was looking for wisdom. She was looking for wisdom. She was looking for knowledge. She was looking for something more to fill her time. Okay? And what does it say in the book, book of Proverbs? It talks about wisdom being a woman. She's She goes through the street spreading wisdom. And that's a good woman. She gives wis wisdom because women want knowledge. They want wisdom. It's She's she's asking for more. Now, Adam could have stopped her. Like I said, there was lots of times during this whole process. Adam could have stood up and been the hero in the whole story. And stomped on, taking that snake and stomped him on his head. And he would have been the victor. He would have been the hero in the story. Instead, he lost his opportunity by not doing what he should have done to protect his wife. I could have said, honey, let's leave this tree. Let's go somewhere else. And we, we'll have a conversation about this. We'll go ask the Lord about it. If you're looking for something more in your life, aren't I enough? She says, no. Obviously, she was saying no. Just like Hannah said to her husband, aren't I enough, honey? She said, no, you're not. You're not enough. I need more. I need a child. I need more from my life than just to go pick fruit all day. It's just not satisfying, you know? <laughs> and, it, and so she was looking for something more for her life. And... Adam could have stood up and been a real hero here, but he didn't. He had feet of clay. And he, unfortunately, I mean, I love you guys, I really do, but you still all have feet of clay. It's still a problem for you, okay? Um, So he lets her fall. Adam lets her fall. She is, um, she eats it, and then she gives it to her husband. And because she, oh, I'm not dead. <laughs> and she gives it to her husband, and he eats, okay? Because he only had two choices at that point. He could either die for, he only had one choice, to die. One, I'm one way or the other. With his wife having fallen, he now only had one choice. That was to die. But how he was going to die was the next thing. Okay, now that he'd let his woman fall, what was he going to do? How was he going to die? He was either going to die for her or he's going to die with her. There was no other choice. Because she was part of him. Now that she had done this, he had only really one choice was to die. But how he was going to die was the question. And unfortunately for Adam, he chose to die with her and for mankind. Now, this is what it says here. It says, <laughs> so when Jesus, I believe it was Jesus, was walking in the in the garden and he, they were hiding among the trees and, and sowed for themselves fig leaves. Um, and they were hiding their sin, their nakedness, because now it was now exposed to everyone. Um. 
And nakedness has really been a problem for mankind. I mean, look at how they are able to, um, those who are um, of the swamp are able to manipulate, control, uh, bribe, blackmail, uh, extort, all kinds of things because of nakedness. Okay, think about that. It, the shame of nakedness is a real thing. So when, they, when they're hiding and they said, we're naked and, and the Lord is really angry. Who told you you were naked? Who was able to see what they weren't allowed to see before? Who was able to peep into your nakedness? To see a peep? Who, who was able to become a, make you a peep show? This made him angry. Pornography makes him angry people. Okay? Someone else's nakedness. Marriage, a covenant between a man, a man and his wife, that's a sacred covenant. And they, someone was breaking their, into their covenant. Um, uh, and the woman confesses and she said, because I believe the serpent, he beguiled me. I was gullible. That's her weakness. That's the weakness of the woman. Not because she desires to be smart or to, to, to know more. That's not a, that's not a weakness. It's not a weakness because we're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. She was destroyed for a lack of knowledge, people. She was destroyed for a lack of knowledge, not because she desired knowledge. She was destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And she, because she didn't know better, because she was gullible, and that's the woman's weakness. She's gullible. And just like the man's weakness is his feet of clay, it's the woman's um, weakness is that she's gullible. Not because she hasn't got she isn't because she has got feet of clay, because obviously if she had feet of clay, she wouldn't have eaten the fruit. Think about that. Okay. <laughs> so it's not a woman's weakness is not her 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 uh, her feet it's her stomach okay and um and her gullibility okay it's her stomach and her gullibility so um as a result of it uh, the lord curses the snake and he says i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between her thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel so we're going to need a second Adam who is uh, got a stronger sense of duty towards the woman who will not allow us to fall or at least redeem us from our fall because he will have feet of brass. And that, of course, is Christ Jesus. And it's interesting that he's, he's talking about himself here in this, in this situation. It's, I'm going to have to be the one that's going to have the brass feet here. I'm going to have to be the one that's going to have to stomp on the head of that snake um, that has uh, gotten here into, this, into your paradise. I'm going to have to be the one with the brass feet. And it's going to bruise my heel. It's going to be painful for me. It's not going to be an easy thing, but I'm going to do it. And it's going to bruise my heel. Adam, you had the opportunity to do this and you didn't do it. So I'm going to have to be the one to do it. And so anyway, in the meantime, he... he increases her sorrow and and thy conception and she will bring forth children in sorrow and her desire shall be to thy husband and he will rule over you this was a judgment okay he she will desire to have more and he will suppress you he will dominate you he will keep you under his feet because he's got clay feet okay because he's got feet of clay, he's going to keep you under his feet. Okay. And so Adam, so he says to Adam, because you listened to your wife and, and you ate of the tree, which I command you do not to eat, you're going to be cursed. Everything you, you do in life is going to be more difficult. You're going to have sorrow. Um, oh, she eat of it all thy days of the, thy life. Because he ate it, this is going to settle in your stomach too. And it settled in his stomach by cursing the ground so that things that he produced, his production would be hindered by thorns and thistles. Um, and he shall have to sweat, sweat uh, the, face, uh, the face to eat, to eat bread till thou return to the ground from whence thou was taken for thou art dust and dust thou shall return. So death is now in the world because of Adam, um, because he didn't pass the test. So this is a very interesting um, story, and it goes along with what I'm telling you about 
the curse and being set free from the curse. Um, now, I want to go on to talk about this next dream that I had. Let's see if I can talk about that first, or I should talk about the other thing that I had to say. Let me see if it was. Um, oh. Let me tell you the dream first. Okay, let me get to the dream because it's already half an hour. So, a couple hours ago, three, a few, a few hours ago now, it was in the, it must have been about nine o'clock or maybe a little after nine o'clock last night. I was sitting in my chair because I had uh, gone to sit down in my chair and I was watching a movie. I was watching um, one of those uh, uh, Hallmark romance not, uh, movies. No, I think it was called uh, Time for Miracles or something like that. It was about, uh, uh, I, just, I, I only got the first part of the movie because I recorded it. I like to record my movies because, or anything I like to watch because then I can fast forward through the commercials, which are horrible, horrible, or through parts that you don't want to watch or too violent or too whatever. Uh, you can fast forward through them or skip through them. So that's what I like to do. So anyway, I had recorded this movie just to watch to see what it was about. And it started, and I think it was some, a movie about a woman who whose mother died and had a list of gifts or things that she wanted to give to some friends, I guess, before she passed. And anyway, I didn't get through the movie because I fell asleep. Okay, just to say. That's what I was watching. So anyway, I had it on and record, and I was watching it, and I fell asleep. Um, and uh, so when I woke up, the movie was still playing, so it must have been only an hour and a half. It wasn't long before I'd fallen asleep in this while I was watching this movie. Um, anyway, in the dream, I was there were some things that had happened, and I'm still racking my brain to remember them because I they they were leading up to what was happening in this dream. Oh, I should have brought some tissue over here. Um. I have to stop the video. Um, yeah, I will. Hold on. Just a second. Okay, I'm back. So, I'm sitting in my chair, watching this movie, while I'm asleep. Some things were going on in my, my dream. And then the dream shifted. I was sitting, I thought I was awake. Because in the dream, I was sitting in my chair. Okay? Just over here, watching TV. And, uh, so as I'm sitting there in my dream, watching TV in my dream, I go to fast forward, I to press the fast forward button. Um, I guess I, I, in my dream, I said it's time to skip because I'm at a commercial or something. And um, all of a sudden, um, it was, I, like, I thought it was real. This was so real to me. It was like, whoa. Unbelievable. Wait till I tell you with this dream. So I, I, I go to fast forward in the dream from the movie that I was watching. And all of a sudden, the power goes out in the whole house. I, I knew, even though, because I knew my sisters were upstairs. And the power goes out. And I knew at that moment, it wasn't just in my house. I knew that the power had gone out everywhere. The sense I got that the power went out throughout the whole world. That's the sense. That's how, how powerful this blackout was. And it was so fast. It was like this, bam. It, it was, I don't know how to explain it. It was just this explosion. And so every, every um, electrical power station had just gone out um, and all over the world and it was it was uh, shocking and I'm thinking oh okay, what just happened the next thing I know I'm hearing a rushing sound it sounded like a train coming through my house it was the sound of a massive 
noise. Um, I, I, I don't even know how to explain it except what it says in the scriptures when it talks about uh, in the book of Acts when the coming of the, the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and when the day, this is Acts 2, 1 and when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all in one accord excuse me, in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and it appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a, as a fire as it sat on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's what came to my mind was the sound was from God. It was this massive rumbling sound that was huge. The next thing I experienced as after I heard this noise was all of a sudden... I felt like I was exploding on the inside. I don't know how to explain it any other way. I felt like I was exploding um, from the inside out. Suddenly, it was like my everything. I, I, I jerked out like this, and my legs and my arms all jerked out. And as this was happening, I felt light coming from my mouth, probably from my eyes too, but I knew it was coming from my mouth. And I could see light coming through my fingers and through my toes as I was in this kind of like position of shock almost. It was like a shocking experience. And it was so real. I really thought it was happening. And as it was going on, this this, this energy, like I thought, I, thought I, I thought it was exploding. <laughs> That's the only way I could explain it. It felt like I was in an expl I was being exploded like dynamite and um, as this was happening I said it's happening it's happening I could be barely squeaking out the words it's happening it's happening and I thought the rapture of the church was going on I thought that that I was experiencing the transforming power of the resurrection power of Christ that's what it felt like I was going through the transformation of the resurrection power of Christ that has talked about how we will all be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Whoa. It was intense. It was really, really intense. But the funny thing about it was, and this is this is when I, I was pondering when because as this was happening and it went on for two or three seconds, I'm not sure exactly how long it was, but it, it felt and like I said, I believed, I thought it was really happening because I was sitting in my chair just like I would do. I mean, I was in my dream. I was sitting in my chair just like I was. And so I thought it was really happening. And so after this happened, and it lasted, this, this whole sensation was unbelievable. But at the same time, well, this was the fascinating thing because when I did eventually, because um, after this sensation began to, to dissipate, and I'm still sitting in my chair in my dream. Suddenly I was becoming aware of the fact that I was, it was a dream. I was waking up. <clears throat> what caught my attention was in the dream I wasn't frightened. There was no fear. In fact, I was quite calm and peaceful about the whole thing. Even though I was squeaking out, it's happening, it's happening. My heart wasn't rushing. There was no pounding in my chest. <clears throat> there was no fear in my stomach. There was no <clears throat> <clears throat> sensation <clears throat> of, oh my goodness, that, uh, how could I handle this? Good. Even though I felt like I was exploding from the inside out, which should have caused me some concern, I was at complete peace. That's the thing. I was at complete peace. There was no peace. I mean, there was no no anxiety or or my heart rushing like, this is, this is too weird. I can't handle it. This is beyond my ability. It was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> and when I woke up, again, I was sitting there and I'm thinking, wondering, wondering to myself, why is my heart racing at this experience? I thought we were being made rapture ready at this moment. All of a sudden, I thought we were being raptured. I thought we were being transformed. And my heart isn't pounding in my chest. There is no feeling of anxiety whatsoever going on in my body. I'm at total peace about the situation. 
that's what that's what struck me. I felt victorious in the moment. I think when I look looking back at now, I, I think the feeling I felt was victorious. That there was a feeling of victory, but the feeling was very peaceful. Okay, so very very interesting. So where I want to go with this, and what the Lord is showing me, and I think what happened yesterday with Sidney Powell, the um, president's, one of the president's attorney, there she had a, 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 I think it was a news meeting with um, Giuliani, and uh, there was a lot of women being placed in the positions of power um, in situations that are very important right now, okay? And why I'm bringing this up was because the Lord is keep, keeps bringing me back to Peter. Going back to Peter in the Church of Philadelphia. And when I told you that the, the, the bride has to rise above the Church of Philadelphia, which is brotherhood, which is the weakness of men. Now, interestingly enough, when you think about it, it's men's weaknesses, but it's Christ's strength. The Church of Philadelphia... Let's just go to the Church of Philadelphia here for a second. And I'm going to reiterate what I said before. And the Lord's making it more clear to me. And to the angel of the Church of Philadelphia, write these things. See, he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man chatteth, and shouteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Who is the strength in this church? That would be Jesus Christ. He is the strength in this church, and man has little strength. Okay? In the Garden of Eden, if you go back to the story, which I've just told you, in the story, man had a... Uh, he was being tested. What are you going to do about the woman, Adam? He displayed his feet of clay. Okay? When you look at the glory of Nebuchadnezzar and the... The glory of man, that's what the spirit of Babylon is, is Nebuchadnezzar, and is setting up this golden statue of man himself. And he's got this wonderful head of gold, and he's got this, you know, breastplate, breast of silver, and his, his, his um, loins of bronze, and his legs of iron, and his feet of iron and clay, miry clay, which is swamp. His feet are swampy. They're mixed with swamp, iron mixed with swamp, okay? And that is his weakness. The glory of man in his strength and his glory still has a great weakness, which is the exposure of his, the fall, his fall in the garden, okay? In the fall in the garden, when, when Adam had the opportunity to be the hero, to stomp on the head and bruise his heel on the head of that snake, he'd rather not, Okay? And as a result, as glorifying and wonderful as man can be, and his strength and all his strength and glory, he still has swampy feet, okay? Feet of clay. And, and it goes back to Peter, okay? When I was, and I, I told you this before, and I may as well go there again, though, because it's very interesting. When Jesus goes to Peter and three times says to him, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, I phileo you, Lord. Peter, do you agape me? I phileo you, Lord. Peter, do you phileo me? And yes, Lord, I phileo you. Now he's upset at this point because Jesus, either he's upset because Jesus had to ask him three times, or by the third time, he no longer is expecting agape love from Peter. Okay, either because he's not able to or because his feet are clay. I don't know what it is, but something about that and then then Jesus gives a prophecy and saying, when you start when you're young, you'll go where you want to. You're strong, you're healthy, but when you're old, you're going to be weak. Okay, and and I thought to myself, and which is a really interesting analogy because man starts out strong in the beginning. He is dominant. He's strong. He's glorious. He's he's magnificent, and then he ends up weak. And that's where the Lord, it's a kind of an interesting, kind of, um, let's see if I can try to explain to you what I'm, saying, what I'm seeing. Man's glory starts up here and woman starts down here. And she begins this process of losing her gullibility. Man becomes, his, in his strength and his power has to lose his strength. And there's an equalization of the man and the woman. They have to come together and equal. Um, well, the man has to, has to stop dominating over the woman and using his power to dominate the woman, but rather to help her to, to rise up. 
that is really the God's desire for the woman is for her to rise up because her, her agenda is knowledge. Her agenda is to lose her gullibility. She has a desire for wisdom. She has a desire to be more than just a food carrier. Okay. In the garden, she wants more from her life. She has an agenda. She needs more. Okay. So, um, and uh, to look pretty, to look pretty and eat, to bring the food to be served. She has more in her, her, that than just to be, you know, those, those things. She needs wisdom. Okay. So what's happening is the inequity in the garden, what happened through sin, man went up here and woman went down here. Rather than walking side by side, there's this, this that happened. And in order to help mankind, basically, is to bring the spirit of man down to his weakest point and the woman up to her greatest strength. Um, <clears throat> and this is what we're seeing here. It starts out the strength of man, which is the color red. That's the, the, the strength, the law. That's the male energy. And then you end up with the feminine energy being in control up here. And that's the, the temple, which is interesting in my last dream where I walked into the temple and I said, no, this is this pool's for women only. Okay. That's the height of the feminine spirit is to, to um, take control of the temple. Because if you think about it, the temple was only for men only. And that was barely even that. Men weren't barely even allowed into the temple. Think about that for a second. The temple was built and it was God's house. But man had to have ropes tied around his ankle in case he went in, when he went into the temple, he did something wrong and they had to pull out a dead body. You know what I'm saying? Men were barely allowed in the temple because of uh, their sin. And women were certainly not allowed. Men were barely allowed in. Women certainly were not allowed. They were off to the side in some other place, off to the side of the temple. They weren't allowed to participate. This is what I'm saying. This Women down were here and men were up here. And there was this inequity, in, um, in, in, in I can't even say the word, inequality between the man and the woman and their place in the world. <clears throat> Okay, I hope you understand what I'm saying. This is a curse on the woman. This is the curse of mankind. And man can't find his full strength and his freedom from oppression himself and from all his hard work as long as the woman's under his feet. Okay? <clears throat> so here we have Peter unable, unable to love the Lord with an agape love, and yet it's perfect love that casts out fear. And not only is it perfect love that casts out fear, it is <clears throat> a perfect love that the Lord is looking for, because without agape love, we are nothing. Okay? With, so Christ loved us with agape love. And so what the Lord was saying to Peter, he says, you're going to start out strong. <clears throat> you're going to start out, you know, I'm a man. I can do it. I can go. But when you're old, you're going to be carried around. You're going to be weak. Christ says to Peter, basically, when you allow me to be your strength, when you stop being the one, the one in control and allow me, because through my grace is made perfect through weakness. My grace for you is made perfect through weakness. So we're seeing the man. I hope you guys are staying here. I know this is really hard for you. He's going to make you weak. And what's interesting to me as I'm, I'm watching this whole thing play out is that the women are rising up. I don't know if you noticed this. There seems to be a power in the woman that's rising up and saying, enough is enough. We are done with this. You, this, this, this brotherhood philosophy that says, we're going to let you walk all over the woman. We're going to let you walk all over the children. We're going to let you walk all over everything in order to maintain power. It's even in the church. I don't know if you notice it. Uh, you're seeing Christian leaders, Christian men particularly, but Christian leaders who are freaking out, who are freaking out by this, this new thing that the Lord is doing. Uh, it's really remarkable. I, we're seeing it play out. I mean, we hadn't seen all this shaking going on, a whole lot of shaking going on. We wouldn't have seen these Christian leaders having freakouts. Their world is coming to an end. The world of man, the, the Nebuchadnezzar uh, 
empire building man is coming to an end and they don't know what to do about it because this is this is goes contrary to what they believe their theology and their doctrine has led them to believe that man is to dominate forever and ever and woman's always to be down here somewhere because of her sin and we're to walk all over we're to conquer we're conquerors and and yet that's not what the Lord is leading them. He's leading them through the process of the rise of the woman <laughs> back to the place where he wants her, which is equal with man. And that's freaking their minds out. They can't get it. It's like Christian leaders. They were, I, I'm thinking, why are the Christians, particularly the Christian men, having such a difficult time with this move of God? It's because they're becoming weak. Because the Lord has led them to this place of weakness but this is what exactly is what's going to need they're going to need to be weak in the lord in order for them to defeat the synagogue of satan because without that weakness as long as they think that they're in control their feet of their feet of clay their miry clay that swampy element in them that's this this <clears throat> this weakness in their soul that allows the swamp to exist is Never, they're never going to be able to overcome the synagogue of Satan. They're never going to be able to rise above the synagogue of Satan as long as they allow their feet to be, remain swampy. <clears throat> this weakness in them. And the Lord is bringing them to that place where he's exposing the swamp. The swampiness in mankind. The swampiness of the brotherhood. That has allowed them to be controlled and manipulated and control and manipulate other people through the swamp. That comes through their feet. Now, going back to David, which is interesting, and he brings up David in the Church of Philadelphia. Why does he bring up David? David was a man who killed the giants, and his grandmother was Ruth. And we remember the story of Boaz and Ruth. Boaz was sleeping. He was happy. He had just had, had a really good harvest. The late life was good. He was prosperous. He did you know. Everything was going his way, and now he's lying there on the ground, and he had just had a good drink fast with his buddies, and now all of a sudden, he's having a bad dream in the middle of the night. He doesn't know why. And there's a woman lying at his feet. <clears throat> <clears throat> She's covering his feet. And as a result, a generation later, who shows up? David, the giant killer. David, the giant. This woman gave strength to Boaz. What was the bad dream that Boaz was having? Well, did he have the dream about giants invading the land? Was that the dream that the Boaz was having? That although things were really, really good now, if it wasn't, if it wasn't, if he didn't take care of a situation that was that was um, coming up, which was in a very short, very short time, within you know forty years or so, how long did it take for uh, Boaz and, and Ruth to have children, and then? You know, or Jesse have his sons and David the youngest. <clears throat> and if it wasn't for David the youngest, they'd still they would have been taken over by giants because they would stay were standing in the in the valley of decision and nobody would go forward to kill the giant. And there was this young man named David who had the courage to do what the others could not do because of the strength and the faith of this woman named Ruth who laid at the feet of Boaz. Perhaps that was the bad dream that Boaz was having, the dream about giants invading the land. Who knows? Interesting to think about. But anyway, nonetheless, here's the key of David. The key of David, the strength. And in that story, there was five stones. that David picked up five stones in order to kill, not just Goliath, but his brothers too, to kill the giants in the land. He already used one on David. I mean, on Goliath. He used one stone on Goliath. What were the? Where were the other four? Where were the other four stones? Did he use them? I don't think he had the opportunity. Perhaps that's the meaning of the four stones. These four stones were going to kill four more giants. Interesting, just to think about. Okay, so in order for the synagogue of Satan to be defeated in the Church of Philadelphia. The spirit of the woman has already risen to this place. Okay? So here's the strength of man, and here's the weakness of man. The strength of man, the, the weakness of man. 
Man is now resting in Jesus Christ because he's opening him and he's giving him the key of David. And now they're able to. And this is what he's saying to Peter. He says, now, when you're, you're, you're young, you're going to go where you want to go. But when you're old, you're going to be weak. And phileo love is only going to take you to a soul, to a certain place, to a certain degree. Then I told you before that the bride has to rise above the, the, the brotherhood. The bride has to go and rise above the brotherhood to the next level. Okay? And that's where I think this dream has led me to this last couple of dreams where I went into the temple, which I believe is the third temple. It looked like a power station. It's an interesting. And then this, this dream, last dream I had, I was filled with power. I was filled with power. Massive power. Resurrection power. And in this last, the dream, last dream I told you about, I walked into the temple. And I walked into a pool. And in the dream, this man who looked like a high priest, he was wearing heart, like a turban kind of thing, and priestly kind of garbs. And I had put my hand through this force field. And I, when I could see it, I could put it through. And I was didn't have a problem putting my hand through. And then I walked through the force field and I walked into the pool. And I knew this pool was going to be this power source for the third temple. It was the, it was the spirit of perfect love. And when I got into the pool, I said out loud, this pool is for women only. Okay? It's the spirit of agape love. This and then when I came around to the other side after I got out of the pool, the high priest man was putting his hand through. He tried to put his hand through three times. When I look, look, look back at my dream, he was trying to put his hand through the force field. And he tried three times to put his left hand through the force field. And he pulled it back three times. Just like Peter, who, when Jesus Christ asked him if he agapeed him, and he said, I phileo you, three times he said it to him. Three times is a very important time when thing when you say something once, it's it has significance. But when you say it twice, whoa. You say it three times, like whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like that's that's that, that is that it's a very strong statement of finality. And in this dream he tried three times to put his hand, left hand through the force field, and he kept pulling it back. And then I again said to him, this pool is for women only. That is the bride rising and dr driving the agenda to the next level. The bride who is married to the bridegroom, who is Christ Jesus, who, by the way, didn't have feet of clay and was able to stomp on the head of that snake. And it's the perfect love, which you will find in the church, in the Song of Solomon. That's when you go back to the Song of Solomon and you see this group of women who rise up because of their love this agape love for the bridegroom. He kisses her with the kisses of his mouth. There is a agape love between this man and this woman. And in this book, you see this group of women who the Lord and the Lord told me 10 years ago, 10 years ago. And it's the word he gave me. And it's the word I'm going to stick with. I didn't understand it when he told me because it was one against my theology. It didn't make sense to my theology and my background. And Man being in charge and men, women being down here somewhere and men being up here, depending on your theology. That's, the, what's, that's what I grew up. And so I, I'm i struggling with the, with the word the Lord gave me. He gave me the word. I must choose my bride from among the daughters of men. I'm not, I will or should, but I could, but I must. I must choose my bride from among the daughters of men, not the people of God, not my church, not the church of Philadelphia, not from the baptized believers. He said, I must choose my bride from among the daughters of men. And when you look at the church, of, if you look at the Song of Solomon, this wonderful, beautiful, um, uh, um, poetic, pro pro prophetic word about the bride of Christ. And he talks about this woman um, she's a Shulamite, she, which means, by the way, peaceful. Shulamite means, means peaceful. There, but he talks about this group of women who will rise up, who will love him with the perfect love that he's looking for. There are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. My, my dove, my defiled is but one. So there's going to be one woman who's the undefiled, but he also has a group of women who are going to fuel with agape love, his temple. 
very, very interesting. Then they are crying for her to come back when she is taken by the chariots. Um, very, very interesting. Now, then you also see the woman, and it's and that's not just here. It's also it's also in Revelation chapter twelve. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve, twelve stars. And she being with child, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another great wonder in heaven, another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And he drew the third part of the stars from heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So it's there too. And this woman is saved. She is delivered. And she is uh, exalted. Okay. So it's not just in uh, Song of Solomon. It's also here in the book of Revelation. So when the perfect shall come. And as we know that the throne room of God is surrounded by a rainbow. And the perfect is actually the woman. Is the Eve. The Lord is bringing his church to that place. The brotherhood can raise to this point, they can raise no farther. And it's interesting that the 144,000 who are uh, walk and talk or walk with the Lord um, after the woman has been glorified and has gives birth in heaven, the 144,000 are loved with phileo love. Right here, okay? Here, not doing that part. They rise to their, their positions of power the 144,000, and they are thought to be men, a group of men. They could be women too. I don't know. But all I do know is that the Lord loves them with phileo love, and you will find that in the book of Re uh, Revelation, the church of Laodicea. He says, those who I love, that's phileo, um, he loves them with phileo love, even though he loves the church of Philadelphia with a agape love. So it's very interesting because they represent the, the, the height and the strength of the church of Laodicea would be the 144,000. And he loves this church with phileo love, with brotherly love. Isn't that interesting? And that is the, the brothers of Jacob, the uh, Jacob's sons. And they are children of Jacob. And that's the 144,000. And he will love them with phileo love. So I think it's a very interesting contrast when you look at it. But the bride he loves with agape love, and the bride loves him with agape love. And it is a group of women. Okay? So very, very interesting. The Lord is showing me some amazing, amazing things. And this last dream I had, when, like I said, I thought it was really, really happening. I thought we were experiencing the rapture of the church. I thought we were experiencing the transformation. Because I felt like I was exploding from the inside out, and light was coming through my fingers and my, my mouth and my, probably my eyes. If I could see my eyes, I, I just saw light coming through this way. And through my toes, I thought I was exploding. And what came to me exactly was, not exactly, um, that uh, in the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost. Let me see if I can find it again. Acts 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a, of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like fire, and it sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and it began to speak with other tongues, and spirit, spirit gave them utterance. So, interesting times we're living in, and very interesting experience. Um, it wasn't just a cloven tongue, just a little tongue of fire. This was massive. So I think this is, again, an, an anointing is coming upon women, the bride of Christ, that uh, we're going to see power, these women who have been empowered by the Lord, who are not going to allow the swamp and men with feet of clay uh, keep the world in the situation that we're in. It's, it's, it's the time of the end of the rule and reign of man and the rule and reign of the bride and bridegroom are coming to its position. And I think that's probably why I hear all these men, particularly even Christian men, who are having a freak out. The end of the world is coming. As far as they're concerned, it's the end of the world. I'm, I'm really shocked. I'm listening to these Christian men, and they're freaking out. They're freaking out because it's the end of their world. 
It's the end of that statue of Nebuchadnezzar, the spirit of Babylon, that has dominated and ruled the world, and, and they've had it their way for so long. For 6,000 years, they've had it their way, and now it's coming to an end, and they don't, this empire ruling philosophy, um, you know, empire building philosophy, we're going to build our empire. We're going to we're going to take what we want when we want it, where we want it, and how we want it. We don't care who we hurt in the, in the process. It's coming to an end, and the spirit of the woman is rising up and said, "This is enough. These are our children. These are our families. These are our, you know, our homes. These are our things. You're destroying things that that belong to us. You have no right." And the woman is no longer becoming gullible because the knowledge that she she longed for in the garden that she didn't have, because she was gullible. She was looking for something. She was looking for something, and now that, that's been fulfilled. We are gullible no more. He is, he is setting us free from that spirit of gullibility because our knowledge of the wickedness of these people and what they've done, how wicked wickedness is and how evil evil truly is, we're now full of that knowledge. I, I think that's what the Lord is saying. We're so full that we're gullible no more. And that's what he's looking for in his bride. He's looking for women who are gullible no more. Okay? That weakness is gone. And our our true trust, our true faith is in Christ Jesus and Christ alone. Because no man, as much as we love our husbands and our, our brothers and, and our sons, they have a weakness in their soul. There's a weakness there. And the only one you can truly trust is Christ Jesus and Christ alone. Because even the Christian men are showing their feet of clay in this time. We pray for you all. We pray for you, man. We do because you have a hard job trying to rise above the brotherhood and trying to defeat that weakness in your in yourself. But you will overcome. Interestingly enough, you will overcome in the next phase of God's move. You will overcome because you won't have a choice. And I think that's the hard part: is that you won't or you won't have a choice. Okay, and that I think is where. You're probably struggling because up to this point you thought you had a choice. I think that to this point you thought you had a choice. Um, and the Lord is showing you because you're un unable to rise to that agape love, you won't have a choice. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because you are, because you're men and you're, you're, you have this empire building mentality, you've got to rule and dominate the world. And you still haven't quite given everything to Christ Jesus. You're going to get to, the Lord is going to have to lead you to a place where you don't have a choice. Just like Peter. Peter, you're starting out strong, you're healthy, you can go where you want. But when you're old, you're going to be led around. Because that's where your weakness is going to lead you to. Okay, but for the woman, the woman just keeps getting stronger and stronger. And that is for the good woman. Not all, There's also the bad woman, of course, there's the, the whore of Babylon, which the good woman we are fighting against. We are fighting against that whore, and she will go down too, by the way. So don't worry about that. The Lord has got that in control as well. So uh, anyway, very interesting times we're living in, and I hope you got through this video. It's an hour and 14, 15 minutes long. Um, but I just... I'm. I'm fascinating with I'm fascinated with this because the Lord is now showing me the the puzzle pieces are all falling to place because I, this all went against my theology too, and uh, like I said I can understand why men don't like me because <laughs> because I I'm not uh, entranced with anyone but Jesus Christ, He's my Lord and Savior and He's the one I depend on, He's the one I love, He's the one I cling to, and that is, is my calling, and uh, I can see how that is a threat to men. I can understand it much better now because their their empire, of the empire, the domination of man is coming to a sudden fall. Because that's what happens to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. It's hit by a stone and it falls because that's what happens. The empire man has to come down. The rule of man and his self-will, there's the name will again, the self-will and the rule of man has to come to an end. Women have to rise up and say, not that this is enough, enough of this slavery, enough of this domination, enough of this 
corruption. We are done with it. Stop taking and stealing our children for your, your evil purposes. You know, these are our children. Stop objectifying our children in our homes and our lives. We are we're important. We are as equal to you as as you think you are to each other, to you know, the, the brotherhood. You're all equal to each other, but you've always put the woman under your feet. Well that's gotta stop. It's gotta stop and and it's not gonna happen anymore. And the we can see this happening, the spirit of the woman is rising up and saying this we're not gonna take that anymore. It's not right. Anyway, I think I've I've uh, lectured enough. But anyway, anyway, it's, it's interesting times we're living in, and uh, I, I just feel sorry. I really feel, I feel a little discouraged that that the Christian man is really struggling with this. I, I mean, I can understand the swamp. We're seeing the swamp put up a fuss like crazy. But the Christian man, and I, you know, just to see how swampy the Christian world is, is really discouraging to me. But anyway, I think that's all I'm going to say. If you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, there's still opportunity. Jesus Christ takes away our weaknesses. He covers our sins with his blood. And he died on your behalf. He did what Adam could not do, and he became the second Adam. And uh, you can be part of his body and his church. And Peter said, uh, Acts 2.38, And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to all your children, to all that are far off. So basically, it's for all of us. This freedom that the Lord is bringing and promising to us all is for all of us, Jew and Gentile. So um, repent to be baptized, every one of you, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God bless. I will talk to you later.